In one of the suttas, Buddha said something really interesting. He said, uh, just as the ocean has one flavor, that of salt, the Dhamma Vinaya has one flavor, that of release. It's a very simple statement. And the Dhamma Vinaya, Vinaya is uh, apparently his reference to the entirety of all of his teachings. So it's a very broad statement and it has one flavor and that is release. So um, I thought it was so beautiful that it was so clearly um, Oh, really? To where? Oh, <laughs> false alarm. Um, yeah, I thought it was it's so fascinating that uh, the whole thing was, was um, sort of reduced to that one word, release, which isn't just a word, of course. It's a, um, uh, an experience and even more than that. But I tend to completely agree with that, that in the end, it comes down to a sort of release that is endless. Um, so we could ask release from what? Well, that happens at level at different levels. Um, uh, perhaps you could say the release from identity occurs in layers. And um, the, the, the first release perhaps could be said to be the release from the gross illusion uh, that that I'm a person, uh, I'm doing just fine. Um, the thoughts I have about myself are real. The thoughts I have about others are real. The thoughts about the world are real. Uh, this world of thought is real. And there's a release from that <clears throat> illusion that goes something like, um, all of the promises that I've heard through that, the medium of thought, communication, words, and language uh, the messages I've received from other people growing up and so forth turn out to be suspect at best and completely wrong at, at, at worst. And that is that this is what you do X, Y, Z, and then you'll be happy. You do this, you'll be fulfilled. You get married and have children, you'll be happy. You succeed in this way and that way, you'll be satisfied, you'll be happy. And I think um, it doesn't take much more than a modicum of authenticity for the typical older teen age person or young adult to realize that that's bullshit, right? It's largely just not really accurate. Maybe it works for some people, maybe, <laughs> but even then I'm suspicious, right? Um, so we start to become um, disillusioned, we could say. And uh, there's another uh, part of the suttas where Buddha talks about um, actually developing a distaste essentially for the aggregates. Um, that he's instructing the monks, you have to actually develop a distaste to be released from these things. Uh, and perhaps it's not as much a practice as, as more like an effect, something that happens where we start to develop a distaste for the usual uh, ways that people talk about getting along as humans. And uh, the distaste is something that just feels like that's just inauthentic somehow. It doesn't feel deeply true. It's not true in my experience. Like I've accomplished to some degree those things that I, I was told I was supposed to accomplish and it just did not bring lasting peace, uh, did not bring deep satisfaction. Um, so perhaps you could say that's the first, or uh, at least in, in one way of looking at it, the first release is you're released from the, the sort of blanket of inauthenticity that is superficial human communication. Um, and it's not hard to find that that matrix of superficial human communication if you just look around, look at the media, look at you know a lot of the things we we even talk about to each other and so forth. Uh, but underneath that, underneath the surface, there's this um, little bit of a different world, a world of uh, like a lot of suffering, a lot of uh, anxiety, a lot of depression, a lot of frustration, confusion, disorientation. Uh, and then the physical manifestations of that in the world, um, violence and not getting along and discord and uh, ideal, uh, ideologies and everything that comes of those and nationalism and just all of it, right? Um, those to me are the effects of that, that sort of cauldron of suffering that's underneath that thin veneer of, of inauthenticity. Uh, so we wake up to that. That's the first noble truth of Buddhism. Life is dukkha, life is suffering or unsatisfactory. 
in the way we usually live it. Um, and yeah, that's to be released from the, the, the fundamental, not the fundamental, the, uh, the initial superficial illusion of uh, what it is to be a happy human being. Kind of realizing that um, pretty much everyone's faking it, right? Everyone's sort of faking it. Um, that I remember personally that period of my life when it was like, oh, I'm not only I'm not the only one suffering. It's like kind of everywhere, but for some reason we we find a sort of certain social currency in faking it and pretending we're okay, right? There's something about that it gets rewarded somehow, but it's still not satisfying and it's still not true. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe some people can live that way and other people just realize it just doesn't work and they can't. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're initially released of something and w when that release occurs, what's revealed is uncomfortable, right? Not that it wasn't there before. We're, it's just that we're coming to terms with it and more directly and more honestly and more sincerely, but there is a lot of suffering going on. And it's not just out there, it's actually something in here, right? Um, what I see out there is just a bunch of in here's communicating with one another. So there's something about the way I'm internally processing the world um, that seems not quite right, not quite um, uh, correct, and not supportive of deep peace and satisfaction and honest communication and feeling settled and so forth. Um, uh, living in accord with the world around you, with nature, with people, and all of it. So, so that's that's the first pill we swallow, the hard pill we swallow um, as we start to wake up. Um, and sometimes that leads to a sort of search. Uh, sometimes it leads to a sort of nihilism. Sometimes it leads to getting creative with how you live in that matrix, like you know, um, finding a niche that is. Uh, just rebellious enough, but not re not so rebellious that it actually wakes up from that matrix. But you can kind of you know, find your rebellious uh, hive and convince yourself that you're different enough that you're not actually address that you're you're somehow addressing that issue, but still kind of miserable. You know, and I think we all we try that often when we're maybe adolescents. We try different groups of people or different ways of thinking or paradigms and so forth, and realize like, oh, that doesn't really work either. <laughs> So, um, so then in one sense, we're released of, of the, the sort of belief and strategies, at least as they exist inside that, that matrix of, um, of inauthenticity. And then uh, we may or may not become a sort of seeker, spiritual seeker, or come into contact with some doctrine or some pointing that says, oh, this, oh, this may actually be what I need to address. Uh, uh, and for some people, it's far more, uh, far more salient than that, far more, uh, revealing in that you say, you know, you intrinsically know that this is where I have to go. This is what I have to investigate, what I have to look into. Um, often that's the, the start of the sort of spiritual unfolding in earnest. It's, it's ineffable. It's beyond, everyone here knows, that everyone in this room definitely knows this uh, and has experienced it and gone through it. But um, for people out in YouTube land and so forth, uh, this is something that's more real than real, as we were describing yesterday or discussing yesterday, something that is so real that it, it, it's a sort of conduit beyond that matrix of suffering and the cauldron of internal strife and anxiety and all that that we find ourselves in. And then the the blanket of inauthenticity that we use to communicate with other humans and kind of lie about a lot of stuff and uh, about ourselves, you know. Um, but this, this thing you come into contact with or this possibility or this teaching or this person or this book um, feels like a conduit. It's like a, you just picked up a diamond or you picked up a gem or something that's just so, has so much splendor to it or so much, um, truth to it, so much reality to it, that it can't be ignored. Now, even then, I think sometimes we ignore it for a while because we actually sense the power of it. We sense the, the import and the effect this is going to have on us at a very deep level. You almost feel the foundation starting to shift a little bit. Uh, and so I think sometimes people do bury it 
for a bit or try to avoid it or just run in the complete opposite direction um, for a bit. But I think for the most part, you really can't do that for the long term once you've tasted that, that, that initial taste. Um, you could say that that, in one sense, is a different kind of release. It's sort of the release of uh, the release of the belief that you, as you know yourself, as you take yourself to be, have to figure all this out with the resources you've been given in this mental world you live in. Uh, this you're, you're released from that because now you you know somehow instinctually there's something else. It's sort of beyond you. May you may perceive it as God. You may perceive it as the, a path or the spiritual path or source or just the unknown or you have no name for it or label for it but you know damn well something else some other dimension has come into a play in this lifetime for you uh, and it may feel quite beyond you in physical form you may not personify it at all but you feel it it's a it's a feel thing and so so in one sense you could say you're released of the of a certain burden that you have to sort all this out yourself as you take yourself to be which uh, ha is a kind of bittersweet experience. Often, it's there, there's a uh, that's the first step of true surrender. You realize uh, that you don't have you don't have the faculties to make yourself happy. Really, deeply satisfied. You don't have all the faculties. You have access somehow. You know you have access, but uh, again, in the way you take yourself to be, in the way you perceive yourself. It, that that doesn't it's not going to cut it it's not going to work it's the problem you're looking in the mirror you're looking at the problem and so something about that uh releases us from the the burden of of the the conventional self or at least it did for me and again it has it's like a double edged sword almost or a bittersweet thing because you feel something incredibly powerful and you know or at least you sense it can do something. It can transform somehow. It can really make change. Or, but but you also sense it's not in your control. It's not in the way you think it's going to be, and you sort of feel that. You can feel the gravity of that. Uh, and so, then I would say we're really engaging the spiritual path, so to speak, the the spiritual possibility. We're 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 um, we're lined up. Uh, we're becoming grace prone. I think Adyashanti would use maybe a term like that. Um, so then uh, we investigate direct, more directly somehow. That investigation may be uh, an investigation of inquiry. It may be an investigation of practice in a relationship with a teacher or a sangha. Uh, or it may be uh, um, that investigation may be an investigation into what happens when I do exactly the opposite of what I've been taught to do all these years, which is actually let go, is to let go of all that. This is a, I'm not sure you can choose that path. Some people, that is the path for them at this point in their life. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, just a massive surrender. <clears throat> and this, however that plays out, whether it's this massive surrender uh, whether it's an investigation into the nature of thought and consciousness and mind or um, so various types of inquiry, whether it sounds like a tradition like Advaita Vedanta or Buddhism or whether it, it just feels completely intimate and doesn't have any spiritual sort of um, flavor to it. Regardless of how all of that plays out, by this time, again, you're engaged in something that is bigger than you, that is beyond you, and you feel it to some degree. And the gravity of that gets stronger, for sure. Sometimes it happens very quickly, and sometimes it takes time. Uh, then, uh, at some point, there's a, a the first for the first time, there's a fundamental transformation in what you take yourself to be. A fundamental transformation in the identity structure. And this is something almost like being reborn. Only uh, there's no word for this. You know, Kensho is the word in Zen. Satori is, the, is a word in Zen. Um, I use the term awakening frequently, but it is a is a fundamental, essentially irreversible transformation in what you take yourself to be uh, that often results in a in a quite a release in a in a sort of heaviness or weight that feels like it had been there for so many years that didn't quite realize how heavy it was until it's just not there. Uh, and, a, and a 
a sense of sort of fluidity in our experience of everything, ourself, the world, thought, emotion, and comes with it a, a period of uh, pretty remarkable peace and ease for a period of time, a few months, sometimes longer. Uh, and that's the first uh, big release from the, the sort of gross uh, thought-identified, mind-identified identity structure. And it's a big release. And it's the beginning of the entirety of release. It's the beginning of the complete dissolution of the identity structure. <clears throat> With that, we, we, we know um, at the heart level the feeling of release. In fact, I might say that before that in, in shift, for most people, um, it's quite the it's quite the opposite. What we think is going to make us feel better, what we think is going to uh, satisfy us, is is kind of the opposite of release. It's a sort of fortification, fortifying our character, fortifying our person, fortifying our beliefs, fortifying our thought structures. We've perceived somehow, probably just through habit and through uh, complicity and what we learn from others unconsciously and all of it, we've, we've sort of learned that, that this fortification is the, the way that what we're really afraid of is release, actually, because it's sort of the opposite. And what, what really flips on its head with this shift is that now we're, we are oriented to release. We understand it at a very instinctual level. We just don't necessarily always realize how deep it's going to go. We don't realize how much we're going to have to release <laughs> at some point. Um, sometimes I've said, it's just to be funny about it, but kind of true. It's like when you wake, the first awakening is like waking up from the matrix. You wake up from the matrix and you see this different world you live in, but then you're actually in a different matrix. You're in a different sort of matrix. It still seems like there's a world. It still seems like there's form. The things that are so fundamental or seem so fundamental about the way we process reality, we process experience, uh, that you wouldn't even stop to think that they could not be true, actually. So it's sort of a, a mass of gross delusions that we wake up from with the first awakening. And then there's a, uh, not a necessarily a mass, but a, a handful of much more subtle delusions that are more pervasive, more subtle, and more deeply buried in our processing. That's the world we find ourselves in. It's a, it's a much more free world. It's a bigger world. And we have instinctually now a sense of the value of release but it can be a little tricky to know where to look for the next release or how to go about it. Uh, because identity, the cognitive identity, the, the type of identity where we can self-reflect and go, oh, this is how I am. This is how things work. This is what you do for this to occur. This is what you do for that to occur. That world doesn't feel so real anymore. So sometimes it's, it's as confusing, this post-awakening no person's land is as confusing as do I do anything at all or do, do I do nothing at all? Uh, you know, it, it can be so disorienting in, in that sense. And yet, again, there's a often still an ongoing sense of, of ease that was not there before that shift, that was just not um, known or believed to be possible. So, so then what is the, uh, what are the remaining, uh, uh, identity structures that we're released from or that will be ultimately dissolved. Well, uh, a lot of a lot of what occurs, I think, after awakening, or I observe after awakening, a lot of the material to work through is emotional in nature. And it just has to do with, with emotional repression, which no one really decides to do, but everyone learns to do. We all learn to do it through habituation, through uh, em emotional impressioning when we're younger, empathic impressioning from our families, and then we get it reinforced all the time with just bumping into people all day long. So we have a tendency to repress emotion, to hide aspects of ourselves from ourselves, And um, 
often, even though we've seen through the gross thought-based sense of self, we still don't realize how much the, the cost of holding a sort of judgment system in place, because that helps keep things repressed. And the judgment system is essentially just seeing the world in a dualistic way ongoing. I like that. I don't like that. I want that. I don't want that. That should be that way. That shouldn't be that way. Just that simple mental processing going on, ongoing, keeps uh, keeps a little bit of a, a distraction going into the mind enough that these resistance patterns around certain emotions and so forth can sort of stay in place. Now, I think after that initial shift, they the resistance patterns tend to just ease over time anyway. And sometimes they they are dispelled in, well, sort of funny ways, but they're not funny to you in that because there is so much less identity structure, they tend to just come to the surface in really bizarre ways. So even though in one sense you you are more awake than you were before, sometimes you may act and do things that are just kind of absurd. And you, people around you will know it right away, like that that is... Uh, you're moving out of a sort of delusion sometimes with the way you're speaking, acting, relating, and so forth. And and it's also often ob obvious to you as well. It's almost like you have to watch yourself do these, you know, these crazy things you do uh, just because they're already in consciousness and they can't really be avoided once they're playing out. Uh, and yet, you know, in, in your deep, deeper uh, sense, your deeper instinct that they're not uh, fully integrated belief systems, patterns of behavior, and so forth. So you kind of enter that strange place, but really I think a lot of it is about, um, it, after awakening, a lot of the, the, the work and the material has to do with uh, emotional repression and these sorts of things. Now I think in, in one sense, this, this is where um, having a structured um system that you that you are part of for instance like the eightfold noble path for instance probably does a huge amount of good versus someone who just tries to wing it has no teacher maybe did have an awakening but who knows what they're exposed to they may be watching non-duality videos online that just say there's no one to do anything there's no self there's no doer so don't do anything and yet there's this massive amount of repressed emotional material your friends are telling you you're a jerk and you know you don't have good relationships and there's disaster going on all around you, but you just keep telling yourself there's no one there. Well, that's not really helping, right? So um, that's a bit of an extreme example, but it, I know for sure that it happens, actually, because people tell me it happens. And sometimes they they in, find themselves in this for years and then later come out of it and go, man, what happened? What? How did I get into that, right? So um, th this may be really where something like a structured uh, path, teacher, sangha can be very helpful. Now, there are also potential downfalls, uh, I'm sorry, downsides to Sangha and traditions and stuff because some of them are kind of cultish. Some of them are don't have good teachers, don't have good leaders, have dysfunction in the Sangha. But if you're in a good tradition, uh, it can be quite valuable. Through Samu, through work, through compassionate action, you really do uh, um, dissolve these vasanas that are you know, uh, hanging around in all of us after awakening. And so that's a good place to be uh, a life of service, a life of a vulnerability, honesty, uh, having having someone you submit your ego to, a teacher of some kind, someone that you trust to uh, be honest with you, perhaps going through therapy if you need it. These kinds of modalities are, I think, quite important after awakening. Uh, so, so that's the the release from, uh, to put it simply, reactivity and and emotional repression. And it happens slowly. It's a, usually a, a slow thaw. This isn't one of those things that just changes like on a dime. The, the initial awakening can happen in less than a second, as Papaji always pointed out. Less than a half a second, less than a tenth of a second. It's not a, it's a very, very, it can be a very rapid shift in identity. But the, uh, as can the subject object experience just collapsing that can also happen very rapidly, as can the, the complete loss of a sense of self. Uh, but the work in between all of that, the emotion work, the work around emotional repression and, and so forth, that doesn't happen on a dime. That's the, that's the one thing that does take time. And you can't ignore the relative world of time to work that you have to do this work. So, um, so that's a bit more of a slow thaw often. Uh, you could say that the, 
the patterns of emotional repression and uh, internal uh, distortions, cognitive distortions, uh, dysfunction in relationship and communication with others, and even our internal communication systems, internal family systems can be massively dysfunctional even if you don't interact with others. You can keep it going up in here. All of that took years to, to create. It took years to uh, fabricate in your nervous system through your own growing up families, um, family dynamics, and then experiences with other people. So it doesn't go away on a dime. It, it takes a while to, to reverse that. Uh, but it can be worked through to the degree that, and let me just say something about this. When it, com when it comes to the realization process itself, um, I kind of consider these a bit parallel in one sense in that I don't think anyone in physical form walking the face of the earth can ever say, I'm completely done with all of the emotion work, all of my, my relative perceptions being completely 100% accurate all the time, uh, ability to interact with people in the, the, the sort of best way possible in that given experience or search situation. No one can say that that ever is going to be perfected, I don't think. It just gets subtler and subtler over time. But there are very specific perceptual filters that can and do dissolve with the realization process uh, and to a very fundamental level of experience. Now, the former uh, is, is critical to engage at all, at all levels, in my opinion. The latter, uh, there are certain of those perceptual filters that are not going anywhere until you do this work. So don't ignore this work is, is the gist of all of what I'm saying here. Um, but with all that said, Without the realization part, without the without the the insights and the willingness to let go, the willingness to re be released, without that willingness, you can stay in this stuff for a, your entire life and get into very distorted places with work, with healing, with with even therapy, with all of it, and you can develop like some really bizarre ego structures around that, around being that person that does the work, that did the work, that knows the work, that knows the work you need to do, that gets, and you can get, get manipulative and all kinds of weird stuff can go on. So, um, so just be aware of that. They, that, that when we're talking about realization, the insights themselves are what really matter, but you will hold yourself up if you don't do the, the emotion work, if you don't do the shadow work. Um, my, I, I often quote this, and it's in the it's in my book. But my teacher said this one time, just randomly, in a Tay show, and it, it's so good, and it's just right on the money. <laughs> and he he said essentially, uh, uh, enlightenment is about living out of the innermost promptings of your heart, of your tender and loving heart. Uh, um, he said, but without without awakening and without realization, you'll think you're living out of the innermost promptings of your heart, but you will be living out of the outermost promptings of your deluded ego. So anyone who's come in contact with someone who's really sort of emotionally toxic, but talks in terms of, you know, all the work and the um, healing and this and that sort of, you know exactly what I mean. Um, Lisa Carnes once said something really funny. She said her, when she was waking up, her boyfriend used to say, beware of the, say, beware of the peaceful ones. And she goes, I just thought he was being an asshole. She goes, and then later I realized exactly what he meant. You can, you can adopt a, a, a persona of the, of the spiritual one and so forth. And it can be very manipulative to the extreme in a situation where we're talking about like someone with true sociopathy, you purposely develop that you learn to talk about love and unity and so forth so that you can get a bunch of people around you to do what you want them to do. And you become a cult leader and this happens still. Right? So, um, so it's important to always look at things in their context and look at what's really happening, not what someone says is happening with all of this stuff, of course. But I do think that these are in tandem. The, there is a lot of emotional work that will need to be done and some shadow work and so forth. How specifically you do that um, is, is different for everyone. And I think we're actually in a really good place with this societally because we're opening to more and more different modalities. Um, there are a lot more, there's a lot more acceptance of somatic modalities, very simple things like TRE. Uh, and uh, there is a lot more interest now in, in psychedelics and entheogens and plant medicine which probably does help with a lot of this stuff. I don't think it actually necessarily does the work for you, but it blows you open so much that you have no choice but to do the work. So the integration can be challenging with those sorts of substances or plant medicines, but uh, I think they are, I think more and more people are, are realizing that, that there is, there's a breadth of ways you can address this 
uh, this emotional baggage and this this shadow material that keeps us essentially lying to ourselves or getting getting ourselves turned around in our minds and so forth. So I don't know, probably beat that to death, but it's critically important. And so what what are you releasing or what is the release there? Well, the release really is the release from resistance in my experience. There's no emotion you're ever going to come in contact with or find within yourself that is that is some accursed emotion that's a problem. Uh, it, they're just not. They're not problems. They're, ener- they're energies. But the resistance around them can cause massive challenges for you and for other people you come in contact with. So um, the trick for a while is to even discern the difference between the resistance to the emotion and the emotion itself. Um, the feeling or experience of anger is one thing. But the resistance to anger and the experience of the complex of resisted anger and anger together is a totally different thing. That's when you get passive aggressive, you get, you know, anger coming out in ways you don't even realize it's coming out. Um, Sadness, same thing, right? So grief, loss, sadness are uh, completely benevolent. They're they're parts of life. They're They're the emotional or physiologic or neuro chemical experience we have of loss. And that's just part of life. Gain and loss in the relative world are always going to be here because everything's cycle, everything's cyclic. Uh, but when we repress that, uh, we, we, we really put ourselves into this, this space of self-deception. And for some people, this is a real, real challenge. Uh, and, and so there are these resistance complexes with any emotion, and we all have them to some degree with, with every emotion until we work through these things. Shame is a big one, right? Shame... Uh, uh, self-worth issues, and even self-hatred. When these are hiding deep within us and we have a massive resistance pattern around them, they can come out and... Ver- but they, these are what really cause us to become unconscious, to act unconsciously and just go... And it feels seamless. We don't realize we did it, you know? Uh, and and just go, what, what happened? How did that happen? How could that happen? Uh, that's not me. So... So yeah, what we're releasing ourselves from with this shadow work uh, is the illusion that it's not already part of us. That it, the illusion that these emotional energies aren't just part of our physiology, and that and that they're actually completely okay. So we're we're ultimately dissolving that resistance to to all of these energies, to to all of all of experience, because at some point uh, it becomes clear that there's nothing. You, you essentially have the capacity to experience anything that can happen. Um, you may respond to it in, a, in, a, in an intense way or something like physical pain, but you do have the capacity for it. Uh, and so, so we, to be released from these, these uh, resistance patterns is very freeing. And again, it happens generally slowly, but there are sometimes these marked uh, shifts and something really lets go. Um, the way um, Kevin Chanelek talks about working with the fourth and fifth fetters with, uh, um, with reactivity specifically around other people. A lot of people who work through it that way describe significant sudden like releases of resistance to everything. Now, that's not everything, but it's a lot. And often the, the feeling of lightness beyond that can be pretty significant. Now, for others, it just takes time, it takes years, and and the lightness just uh, over time is is cultivated. Uh, so then, the the uh, very interesting and um, probably more attributed with uh, the the sort of esoterics of of Buddhism, maybe, but the interesting perceptual filters of the sense of the subject and the object. Uh, or the sense of there being form, so like the aggregates uh, we're, we're addressing now, what, uh, what creates the sense, what, what, creates, what, what makes it even possible to perceive ourselves as something separate from everything around us, such that we can have our own separate experience, our own separate problems, our own separate perceptions, I shouldn't say experience, but our own separate perceptions, our own separate... Um, um, suffering, our own personal suffering, what makes that possible? What, what even makes that, in our experience, makes it possible? 
And when we learn or realize or understand that it's actually something in one sense that we're doing, it's like a thought, it's like a belief, it's like the way we're engaging a certain thought, belief, or perception in an ongoing way through habit. That's really interesting. It's really interesting to, to think like, oh, okay, the sense that I'm apart from that, that I'm apart from that, that I'm apart from that, that I'm apart from the sounds and I'm apart from the sensations, I'm apart from my thoughts and I'm apart from my emotions, that sense that that's actually even happening, that that's even true, it, um, is an afterthought. It's an overlay. So that's interesting. How do I get to that? How do I get right to that um, that moment of that perceptual formation that says self and other, that says me and that? Um, so when we talk about the subject-object construct or the subject-object filter, let's say, let's call it a filter, one thing that often happens, and I, I remember my Zen teacher saying this, and it was interesting in a talk, the way it played out, but he, he said, you know, I used to like get a flower and I'd look at the flower and I would try to merge with the flower. And he said it was really frustrating. Like, in the, in the, And it was kind of funny because the audience laughed and he's like, oh no, it wasn't funny. <laughs> like, it was really painful because I tried really hard, yeah. And then he, what he said, his explanation was what, what ultimately shifted it for him was he said, but really I just learned to become calm through and through and I learned to let that experience overtake me. I let, I, um, he would often say, let the, the mountains and rivers uh, just overtake you, uh, replace you, he would say, let them replace you. Uh, and I think that's good advice because if you, the, the key with this is to realize that when you see that the sense that there's subjects and objects, and the subject can be a, a solid me and a body, you might be perceiving it that way, it can also be consciousness and it can also be awareness. This is another common thing I see in the sort of uh, online non-duality world is people really reifying awareness as if there's this vast space of awareness. But what you're doing is you're reifying awareness as an object. I'm sorry, as a subject. You're reifying awareness as, as subjectivity, as if there's awareness and then everything else. Uh, Adi Ashanti has pointed this out many times. He says what a lot of people call non-duality is actually a very stark duality. It's a manageable duality because it's a very fundamental duality, awareness and everything else. But just to be clear, when we talk about subject-object, it doesn't mean a physical subject necessarily. It can feel like it. It can feel like I'm here perceiving something out there. But it might sort of feel like a universal perception and then that which it's perceiving. So... Um, just to be clear about that. So the, the reason that, try, that looking out at an object and trying to merge with it doesn't work and is probably just going to lead to frustration or I can't tell anyone, everyone what will or won't work for them. Maybe that works for somebody. But for the most part, what's the, the problem there is you're already presupposing something when you do that. You're already making a supposition, right? You're already supposing I'm here and there's that and we're going to merge together. This is... In, in say the, the common uh, spiritual mindset. This is how I would say, I don't wanna say any specific person, but the, the, the way I hear it spoken of in spirituality often, in a, in a sort of pop spirituality, is like everything's connected. But that's a complete misunderstanding of what subject-object construct dissolving is. Um, there aren't things that are connected. That's not how it appears. That's not how it's experienced. There's not an interconnected field of objects. Part of us wants to see that, see it that way, right? Because I still want to have my own personal self-experience, but I also want to be connected to everything else. Like then you can ma manage, manage it somehow and get what you think you need and all that. It's just not like that. It's a very simple, direct um, investigation and the perception itself that's overlying the perception of subject-object really is an afterthought. It's something that happens after, but it, but it's happening, there's not really an after even to this, but it, it's happening, it has to keep happening. So understand that it has to happen again and again and again and again. So it's more like a distraction than anything. It's a redirection, it's a redirection into the mind. But the mind can easily take a picture of this, right? So just look out at what's in front of you, just whatever it is, right? You can think of it in terms of a bunch of objects or just like a landscape of color and forms. Just take a picture of that and say, that's the picture of what's out in front of me. So the mind, 
very quickly takes that, just grabs that picture, I'm personifying this, but grabs that picture and runs off down the hallway and puts it in a different room. And in that room, there's, there's, there's a subject, there, that picture is the world of objects, and then there's like what I'm gonna do about it, and I'm, there's doership, and there's thought, and there's processing, but none of that's actually happening. So just know the reason I, you say that the, the, the thought process or the mind is, is really just the reflective capacity of mind. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about consciousness. It's the reflective capacity of mind. What it, what it does is it takes a snapshot such that it can use that snapshot to do its bidding. All the other illusions are built on that. The illusion of control, doership, separation, all of it. But you can't think about any of that when you see clearly non-separation, when you see that there is no dualistic uh, experience primarily in, in appearance. That you can't do anything with that. It's kind of like over, right? That part's over. So just understand that the, the, the rapidity with which the mind takes a picture and starts turning it into processing is very, very quick. Um, it's probably varies person to person, but I've talked with people, I can think of a couple of situations where I've talked with people who actually know this really well. They know this doctrine well, and they know it better than I do, the doctrine of, of non-separation in Buddhism and the, the aggregates and all this, but um, who are thoroughly convinced that they, they can't actually perceive the thought apart from the, the visual experience. Like, it's really interesting because, because I know they, not only can they, they are doing it all the time. You're all, it's happening all the time. It's just happening very quickly. But the, how, what am I trying to say? The, the belief that they are actually the same thing, that your processing of the visual and, the, and what's actually there or what's actually appearing to be there um, that the belief that they're the same thing can be very, very, very fundamental for people. Very sticky. Um, but if you've come this far, then you probably will not be surprised when I tell you that they actually are not. They're not the same thing. Not at all the same thing, actually. Um, so then how do you investigate that, that first big step in uh, untying the dualistic experience? How do you how do you approach it? <clears throat> well, uh, we touched on a couple yesterday. I think it was during the question and answer, but it's a fun uh, um, it's a fun inquiry because in one sense you could say this is the first inquiry that just has no it's just non conceptual. So that's the one thing I want to say. The previous inquiries like who am I? Am I this? Am I that? You know, I'm not this. I'm not that. Uh, you know, all the doctrine, all that stuff. It's all conceptual in some sense. It's conceptual pointing to non-conceptuality, hopefully, but it's still a conceptual approach. This is a completely non-conceptual approach. It's just not conceptual. So what you're actually being released from is, is conceptuality applied to, to your sense fields. That's what this release is. That where, where, the, where the clearly non-conceptual becomes conceptual. Um, and what is, where is that interface? How is that interface? Well, one thing that's kind of cool about it is you can find that interface very easily because all you have to do is look at anything. Everywhere you look, that interface is operating. It, you could almost say it's like, this is just an analogy, but you could almost say it's like plastic wrap over everything, right? You're looking through a perceptual filter that, that in one sense doesn't actually make it physically look different. It doesn't physically look different, but it has just enough filtering that it can redirect your attention into a conceptuality quickly. It can redirect your attention back into what feels like the inner world of you apart from that, apart from that, right? And as soon as it feels like an inner, inner world of you, it feels like an outer world of that. Does that make sense? So they're, they're dependently originated, essentially. They're, the, the sense of the subject and object are, in, they're, they're both equally artificial and they depend on one another. You can't really have one without the other. It wouldn't, make, wouldn't work. So. So what is that which is being um, taken, a, taken a picture of to turn into a subject and an object? Well, again, it's right in front of your face. It's right there. It's actually right there. But so, so one, one approach that makes a lot of sense to me is how long can you actually keep your attention there? Because I know sooner or later it will be revealed. It will be revealed in a very obvious way. And 
this usually is very obvious. It's usually like, it's that way, and then it's not, right? It's that way in the sense that there's a me in the room full of objects, and all of a sudden, it's just not like that. Could feel like completely flat, like you have a flat visual field, um, or it could just be completely obvious that there's no, um, there's no special object that's at the center of everything anymore. Um, it could feel that the sense of re relating to a bunch of objects or actually <clears throat> the mind constantly going, constantly deciding what it's relating to and how important that relationship is. Like it's, it's kind of important to relate to this person. A stranger is not important, but my lover, that's a really important, important person to relate to and always managing those relationships that can stop. That's another way this can be experienced where it's like all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's not really a relationship fundamentally because there's not a subject and an object. So really the need to manage relationship in that way doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so any, any of those can be the, the sort of clue that it's either falling or it's fallen. But, um, but it's usually reasonably obvious. There's just not a separation between a subject and an object. That that's just a, a overlay, a construct. Um, so as we were talking about yesterday, one way to do this is just to just look, right? Just to visually examine something. Um, mostly all I can say is what you're not doing. So you're not, you're not thinking about it. You're not going, oh, well, there's a carpet there and it's this color, it's made out of this and it's probably four feet away from you. You're definitely not doing that. You're not describing it to yourself. You're not labeling anything. So that's not what you're doing. There's just seeing going on is one way of saying it. But you're just allowing that seeing to be what it is. You're allowing the scene to be the scene without overtly analyzing it. And then just see how long you can keep your attention there. And just see how that feels. See if it starts to feel maybe slightly different or distance feels a little bit different or something. But I hesitate to give too many pointers because, again, it can lead to analysis. And that's not the point. But just sit with that for a while and practice it. And then at some point, um, you, you might be able to, without overtly thinking about it, you may be able to just sort of monitor how long does it actually take before attention bounces back into here and starts thinking about that, or thinking about me, or thinking about the practice, or thinking about literally anything. Um, when does the pure experience of seeing, or the pure experience of the scene, turn into either a reflected experience of the scene, or just more thoughts? And, and see how long that takes, and see maybe you can stay there for, I don't know, half a second, maybe three seconds, whatever, but if you if you just, make a little bit of an intention to, to notice uh, how long, or notice there's a gap, perhaps, between those two experiences, then you, you might be able to prolong that until it becomes easier to do. Uh, and once it's easier to do, you may be able to sort of move your attention around and just notice other things, other, other visual experiences, um, without having a bounce back into the mind or an analysis occurring. The other thing you can do, and so I would, because this is a non-conceptual exploration, I would do these slowly, like spend a lot of time with them and just gently and try to relax your body, try to do it in a kind of enjoyable setting. Um, another thing you can do is once you feel like you have that gap a little bit or you have at least some of that pure experience where it's not, analysis that your attention's not just like chattering on about this experience or what you know whatever all the stuff it chatters on about but just the seeing is is pretty pretty um pretty clear uh then you can start to just explore the seeing itself the actual seeing a little bit um this is a gentle probing because there's not it doesn't have parts or anything but just Explore the seeing and, and try to find if there's any demarcation between subject and object. If there's any demarcation between the seer and the scene. Is there any demarcation anywhere in that? Is there any 
boundary at all anywhere in the scene. Um, like you, like if, as if I said, there's a, there's a grain of rice on the carpet. You're not gonna be able to see it from here, but if you kind of get closer and start feeling around, you might be able to find it or something. So it's almost a little bit like that. Like you're just feeling into or gazing into the experience more directly to see if there's anything that feels like a dividing line anywhere. Or uh, uh, anything that feels like a here or a there, like a vicinity, like a near or far vicinity. Same thing. Is there any data in the scene that would suggest there's a near or far at all. And if you do perceive that, then ask yourself where your attention is now. Is it in the mind or is it out there? So if you find a, a dividing line or you find some sense that, oh no, there's definitely a sense of subject. Well, go, go back to that and go, well, is it, in the, is it actually in the scene? Or is there something, some processing going on in the mind? Maybe a proprioception, maybe a visual image of the body or a visual image of the chest or the head or the face. Uh, a vi visual image of a point in space or something, yeah? So those are all different ways to explore this. Um, but again, the keys are, it's a non-conceptual non exploration. So there's no cognitive discernment really. It's really just going out to the experience fully and just letting the experience really teach you what it is, teach you what non-locality non is or what non-division is. Um, Okay, how much time do we have? Three minutes. Oh, perfect, we're done. Okay, you have anything else to add? Nope, she's out of here. Stretch it out, girl. <laughs>